We often discuss resistance training as a standalone exercise modality. However, trainees often perform other exercises or sports in conjunction with lifting, or even use lifting to supplement their primary sporting practices. So in this video, we will discuss how to integrate resistance training into an exercise routine involving other sports. First, we need to clarify one important thing. In this video, we are going to be discussing how to incorporate hypertrophy training into an exercise routine involving other sports or activities. We won't be exploring how to use resistance training to enhance performance of other sports. Even though performing some resistance training is likely to have a positive impact on athletic performance for many sports, this isn't the key goal for this video. So basically, we will be discussing how trainees can build muscle while training for other sports. Let's now get into the details. First, we should understand that training for muscle growth isn't any different whether that is your only exercise activity or you are involved in other sports. The mechanisms are exactly the same, nothing uniquely changes about your physiology. However, because we are introducing other exercises into a regime, there are more considerations we need to make. There are two primary physiological considerations that we need to be aware of. First is our systemic workload. This refers to how much total stress from exercise we can handle throughout the week. Ultimately, we can't just perform more and more exercises forever, there is a limit as to how much we can handle. This limit is often referred to as our systemic capacity. Breaching this capacity can result in what we call overreaching, which is essentially just short-term overtraining. And chronically breaching our systemic capacity has been theorized to result in overtraining syndrome. Overreaching and overtraining has been thought to have negative physiological consequences, such as decreased physical performance, increased tiredness and lethargy, altered hormonal profile, decreased motivation to train, and much more. However, it should be noted that overreaching and overtraining aren't very well established phenomena. They are more theoretical. However, it is still a consideration to have when combining multiple training goals. This is because our overall weekly workload will likely be greater compared with only training for a single modality. So essentially, we probably can't perform a high workload for both resistance training and for our other sports. There needs to be some compromise. Depending on your preferences, exercise modality and sports schedule, you can choose to allocate more work to either lifting or to sport practice. And the other physiological consideration is for joint tolerance and injury risk. Similar to the previous discussion on systemic workload, there is only a finite amount of stress each joint can handle. So clearly, if we are using certain joints more in other exercise, we may not be able to tolerate as much workload on the resistance training side of things and vice versa. And the way that the joints are used can also have an impact on how much work they can tolerate. Hypertrophy style training is usually very joint friendly compared with athletic activities like running, jumping and throwing. So what all this means is that we may need to reduce the amount of workload from either form of exercise if our joints cannot handle its demands. So now we have covered the physiological limitations of combining lifting with other sports. However, we also have practical limitations too. More specifically, we are referring to the time available to exercise each day and in total throughout the week. Obviously, performing more resistance training means we have less time available for sport practice, and performing more sport practice means we have less time available for resistance training. So even if trainees can and are willing to handle a high workload of both sport practice and resistance training, they may not practically have the time available to do so. This is probably going to be the biggest limitation of how much workload you can feasibly perform each week. And how you want to split your training time between exercise modalities is completely up to you. Based on your preferences, you may choose to dedicate more time and effort to sport and use resistance training to supplement this, or you may choose to dedicate more time to resistance training and supplement this with sport practice. So now that we have covered the inherent limitations of combining exercise modalities, let's now get into the details of how resistance training variables may need to be manipulated. Like we mentioned earlier, the hypertrophy training principles don't change for those performing multiple exercise forms. They may just need to be practically manipulated to suit your current routine. Let's now cover how and why this may need to be done. 
The first variable that probably requires unique manipulation is volume. Volume refers to the total number of sets performed per muscle group per week. Generally, we find that more volume is better for muscle growth, but probably has diminishing returns. This means that the more sets we perform per week, the more muscle growth we will see, but each additional set is less additionally effective. Like we have discussed, when combining training modalities, we are limited in our resistance training workload due to systemic limitations, joint tolerance, and time availability. Therefore, volume will likely need to be lower compared with performing resistance training alone. This is because we probably can't perform as many sessions per week, or our sessions need to be shorter in duration. So this means we may experience a slightly slower rate of muscle growth. We can still certainly build muscle like this, but it might require a longer time frame. However, because volume has a non-linear relationship with muscle growth, even dramatically less volume probably won't be all that inferior to higher training volumes. For example, if we were to half our training volume, we would probably still be able to see muscle growth at around 75% of the rate that we otherwise would have been able to with higher volumes. So really, it is a trade-off that you need to make your own informed decision about. Another sub-consideration falling under the category of volume is what I like to call volume allocation. This refers to how much we distribute our total weekly volume between each muscle group. Rather than performing the same number of sets for all muscles, we probably want to allocate more volume to lagging muscles and less volume to naturally more developed muscles. While this will largely be influenced by genetics, other exercises or sports will also have an impact. Muscles which are frequently used in specific sports may see significant muscle growth simply from performing these repetitive movements very frequently. For example, soccer players usually have well-developed legs from the high volume of acceleration and change of direction work. So for physique goals, these athletes may want to prioritize the upper body over the legs. This can be achieved by reducing volume slightly for the legs, let's say to around 5 to 10 sets per week. This extra time and energy can then be used to perform more volume for the upper body, let's say around 15 to 20 sets per week. This will likely result in a faster rate of muscle growth for the muscles being trained with a higher volume. This leads us on to the next training variable that may require manipulation when combining resistance training with other sports, and that is your training split. The training split refers to how many days we lift per week and which muscles are trained on which of these days. First, our training frequency, meaning how many times per week we lift, will need to be realistic when considering our sport schedule. This comes back down to our physiological workload limitations and the total amount of time we have available to dedicate to exercise in general. Like we have established, we don't have infinite time and energy available to train each week, so there needs to be a reasonable compromise. The exact number of sports sessions and resistance training sessions you decide to implement is down to your own personal preferences. In terms of the specific training split, this may also need to be adjusted in accordance with your lifting frequency. In general, we probably want to try and train each muscle at least two times per week to maximize hypertrophy. Like we mentioned, resistance training frequency will probably be lower when combined with other sports. So rather than performing a common split routine, it may be best to train more muscle groups per session with less per session volume. This will allow trainees to hit each muscle at least twice per week, which will likely be slightly superior compared with hitting each muscle only once per week. For example, let's say a trainee performs their sport practice three times per week on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. So they have decided to lift three times per week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. With this lifting frequency, this trainee may decide to perform a full body session three times per week rather than splitting it into a push-pull legs routine or an upper-lower arm split. This is because even if total weekly volume is equated, the full body routine will allow each muscle to be trained three times per week rather than once per week, as would be the case with either of these alternative splits. Another variable that may require specific attention when combining lifting with other sports is exercise selection. There are no mandatory exercises for hypertrophy training. Rather, muscle growth can be achieved using many different exercises training the same muscle. So while there are no best exercises, 
Those who are combining exercise modalities may preference certain exercises over others. This is mainly due to something we alluded to earlier, which is joint stress. During different sports, certain joints attack more than others. So when selecting exercises involving these joints, trainees may want to preference those which provide the least stress and irritation. For example, trainees involved in dance or gymnastics-based exercise generally have a higher prevalence of lower back pain. While it may help to train the lower back specifically in some of these cases, for muscle growth, it may be best to avoid exercises that stress the lower back significantly. For example, these trainees may select something like a leg press or a hack squat over a barbell back squat as a quad exercise. This is because these exercises will generally involve less stress on the lower back compared with a barbell back squat. And the last consideration for trainees involved in other sports is the use of metabolite techniques. These can generally be described as training methods which involve lighter loads, higher rep ranges, and shorter rest periods compared with traditional training. Because of the lighter loads used, they are generally less stressful on the joints and connective tissue, while still providing a relatively equivalent hypertrophic stimulus. So similar to the previous discussion regarding exercise selection, metabolite training may be used more prevalently for certain exercises to minimize joint stress. This could be useful for trainees who have particularly irritable joints from their sport demands. For example, grappling sport athletes generally report a high prevalence of elbow pain and injury. So trainees involved in grappling activities may find that traditional training for isolated bicep or tricep training tends to irritate these elbow issues. So in this case, these trainees may want to include mostly metabolite style training, such as drop sets or myo reps to minimize stress on the elbows while still providing a great hypertrophic stimulus. So to summarize this video, let's establish some practical recommendations. Trainees are often involved in other sports or activities in addition to resistance training alone. This is not an issue, but these trainees may need to make a few unique tweaks to their training routines to get the most out of each exercise modality. The most important consideration is about managing your total weekly workload. There are inherent limitations as to how much exercise we can tolerate per week from both a physiological and practical standpoint. So trainees should split up their weekly workload between resistance training and sport practice in whatever way they preference, making sure to respect their workload thresholds. In terms of manipulating training variables, there are a few modifications that may be necessary. First is that total weekly volume may need to be slightly lower compared with someone only performing resistance training alone. Furthermore, trainees should distribute this volume between muscles based on what they want to preference over others, which may be influenced by muscle development as a result of sport practice. Your training split may need to be lower in frequency since fewer days are allocated to resistance training, which also means that a higher muscle frequency may be beneficial compared with a split routine. Trainees may need to be cautious of exercise selection to minimize injury risk. If there are particular joints which are heavily stressed during sport practice, then it is recommended to find low stress resistance exercises to avoid exacerbating the issue. And for the same reason, metabolite techniques may be used more prevalently. This can help to alleviate joint stress because of the lighter loads used, while still providing a good hypertrophic stimulus. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.